Okay, folks, thank you so much for watching this podcast and webcast today. We greatly appreciate it. As you know, I'm Carol Ann from SassyTownhouseLiving.com, and I have with me two guests today that I'm super excited about. We're going to be discussing a whole broad topics from retirement to the COVID virus to aging and everything. We're just going to cover everything. And today I have with me Erica Baird. Is that correct, Erica? That is. Okay, great. And Karen Wagner, and I'm very grateful to the both of them. Um, they formed a website called Luster.net, and it's an online forum founded by the both of them, Erica and Karen, and they're two New York City retired attorneys. Together, they were on a mission to redefine retirement for modern career women by confronting outdated concepts, defying stereotypes, and raising our collective voices to ensure that retirement for all of us is shaped by women for women. And I love that. <laughs> um, right. So what we're going to do today is ask some questions and just let the conversation flow. Whether you're a senior or not, I think you'll find it very beneficial. So I want to start off with a question that I'm sure you've been asked a million times, ladies. Why did you decide to create Luster.net? Who is your audience? And before we jump into that, just tell us a little bit more about who you are, you know, what your careers have been like, and that brought you to where you are today. Okay, well, maybe I'll start. I'm Erica. Um, I and Karen, too, were, were, were both, we were both lawyers and practiced for over three decades in institutions, me in a big four accounting firm and Karen in a major law firm. And then um, after those wonderful careers, which we adored, we retired. And one day we're kind of sitting on top of the world. And then the next day we're kind of in, jumped off a cliff, cliff into no man's land. And we had all sorts of great plans, the two of us. We were going to be consultants, and we were going to work in the nonprofit space, and we were going to use all our skills. And it became quickly apparent to us that nobody was actually interested in using us for any of those things. So we sat back and said, what's going on here? We were not happy campers by any means. And we realized that it was a combination of ageism, to be blunt, and sexism in the sense of being not only older, but being older women. And that there were barriers and stereotypes ranging from, you work so hard for all these years, why would you want to work at all? Why aren't you just wanting to play with your grandchildren or garden or whatever it is you do? To, you know, you're kind of done. You know, we've moved on. We don't, you had your shot and now you're over. So neither of those concepts sat very well with us. And we said, okay, we can do something about this. Hence, Luster was born. Karen, right? Kind of exactly. Exactly. We, uh, we did retire after working really hard for a long time. And at first we played. We did things that we had never done before. We went out to the theater in the afternoon. We made dinner dates that we actually kept. We went to uh, the park and it was one day we were sitting in a park and we said, well, this is fun, but we have now learned that we're gonna be living for another 30 years or so. Are we gonna really do this for 30 more years? And we said, no, we're not. We're gonna do something more purposeful. And so we, um, we had noticed by then that the way older women were portrayed in the media was as doddering sitting peacefully and happily in a field, maybe in a rocking chair looking dim. Mm -hmm. And we decided that was just really not the image we wanted. So we started Luster to create an image of who we are, this new group of uh, women. And of course that necessitated that we figure out how you form a website and how you do a blog and how you do social media and all these things. So we learned a lot of things from a lot of engaging young people. And uh, that's how it all started. That's so exciting. Now, obviously, you weren't told directly that it was ageism, but yet you unraveled this and figured it out for yourself. Am I correct? Correct. Correct. It was, 
it was a process. I mean, and I don't think, I'm sure you haven't really thought about your age as any kind of barrier. I mean, obviously we're older than we once were, but we have a lot of, a um, lot left to do and a lot of energy and a lot of brain power and all those kinds of things that we want to do something with. So there would be no substantive reason, right, that somebody wouldn't deploy those skills. And frankly, the day before we retired, they wanted those skills. So what was different between the day before we retired and the day after we, we retired is we assumed this big, huge mantle of the word retirement or mm. retired. And retired really has age connotations to it. Right. And so that's how we started to pull the string to unravel. It was really about how old we were that was a barrier and not really the skills we had or didn't have. Right. Now, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you if you noticed in the blogosphere world the same type of ageism and discrimination, because um, I have a lot to say about that, but I'm very curious to hear what you ladies have encountered so far. Well, uh, first of all, I'd love to hear what you have to say. But, <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to that. But actually, we've had it pretty rewarding time in what we've encountered. We have occasionally encountered people who suspect that we have nothing much to say. But most of the people that we have been involved with or worked with, most of them are much younger than we are. But really, almost to a person, they say, wow, this is so exciting. Our mothers would love it. We understand you're a new sort of force in this world. We love what you're doing. So it's actually been quite a positive experience for us. Good, good. The only, and, go ahead. the only thing I'd, I'd add, Carolyn, is um, that the way the media portrays people like you and us and uh, generically is not exactly the way we would wish to be portrayed. So in terms of the media, I think there are some barriers that we still need to overcome. I agree. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. And especially with covid um, I remember in the beginning, they were saying, the media, they were saying things like it affects, you know, the elderly or the aged. And a lot of people in my, you know, network that that weren't even really like that were in their 50s, really not fully retired. They were very offended by like, you know, the language that was being thrown out there. And you know, it made them feel very uncomfortable. I don't know if you noticed that. We surely did. And you're quite right that uh, women in particular get start to get old at about 25. And by the time you're 50, it's surprising yeah. you can even walk. And Gosh, uh, so true. over the, that, it's just crazy. But um, we, we realized that one reason for all this is that we are actually new. We are people who will live for another 30 years after retirement. And we will, during that time, be both experienced and healthy and sentient. We're not like the retirees of the 1950s who had a much, much shorter life expectancy and who were tired. They had had hard lives with world wars and the depression and all kinds of things. And they were perfectly happy going to play golf for two or three years with other people like them. And that was fine, but that's a model that just doesn't work for the kind of people that we are. And also the words that are associated with that model don't work either. We're not seniors. We're not uh, about to keel over. We're not, uh, you know, interested in doing nothing. And so we really are new and we need to establish that and establish our image out there so that people understand who we are and what we want and what we can do. I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I mean, overall, like um, our company is a lifestyle company, so we cover a broad range of topics. And luckily for that, we have a diverse demographic. So we haven't really been impacted too greatly in that. And but I notice a lot of my friends that have picked specific niche areas are getting affected. I mean, your site is great because it's for targeted audience. And it's jam-packed with so much information that even 
people outside of that demographic would be able to share with their mothers and fathers and, you know, aging relatives, I guess. But I know a lot of people that are being impacted by ageism. And it's such a tough battle to fight because when you look at other countries, they respect the elderly and they treat them with a completely different, you know, viewpoint of how they look at them and how they treat them. I mean, even in China and Italy, I have friends there and they're like, we revere, you know, our ancestors mm. and our aged relatives. So it's so hard to conceptualize why we do that here. And Especially because not- everybody wants to be older. Exactly. <laughs> yes, there's only one way to avoid being older and nobody wants to go that route. Yeah, so. it's just, I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Um, can you help our audience understand how they can take charge of this chapter in their lives? And not only for women, but for men too. Like, I'm sure you get asked that all the time, but it's very difficult. It's, it's, like when I I was forced to retire, unfortunately, because I had gotten sick, so I had no choice at the time, and and I tripped into this because it doesn't require like too much activity, really. I mean, luckily now I'm fine, but at the time it was a blessing because I'm very tech savvy, and this was like the perfect field for me. But not everybody can do this. Not everybody can, you know, be good at technology and blog. Not everybody has an interest in it. So how do you navigate retirement? What's your words of wisdom? Well, I guess I'd start with you, you need to mourn your loss. You know, there is a there is a loss here if you loved your career particularly. So, so taking the time to mourn it without necessarily dwelling on it, um, but acknowledging it and celebrating it at the same time, I think is part of the process. And then the second thing I'd say is you have to start realizing that you need to rebel against the stereotypes. It's kind of psychology 101, Karen and I are not psychiatrists or psychologists, but we do know that it's very easy to internalize external images and start if you start looking around it's easy to feel badly about yourself pretty quickly if you start seeing yourself as old and done and aged and all those you know adjectives that Karen used before if you start believing that Mm -hmm. you start feeling badly I mean your shoulders start to slump you don't wear the same clothes you don't dress up every day you start living somebody else's image of what you should be so so you be, you manifest it yourself in other words yes yes I think you start to and you have to realize that you need to fight that I mean that's actually work to say I'm not that person I don't want to become that person I'm going to do it differently and so we started the image part of luster is very important to us how you see yourself and how you present yourself to others I think Karen that's kind of core. That is very core. And I think uh, basically what we're all saying is when we reached this stage where we were retiring, there were sort of two options available. One was work and one was, you know, sitting in a rocking chair or playing golf. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for us to be presenting options, a way of thinking about what you might want to do for the next 30 years, images of people, not just being, you know, exercising and looking good, but also doing things, being in the world, being connected to activities in the world, because we don't want to be isolated somewhere and we don't, we really actually don't particularly want to be revered. We want to be part of the mix. And that's just an image that was not available and to a large extent still is not available. So I think our first step is to our own people, which is to say, hey, you know, you have really, really interesting options ahead of you. You don't have to be bound by these stereotypes. And then the next step is to make sure everybody else understands that. Gosh, those are such great points. How do you change the mindset of such an ingrained belief system, though? Just do you think you just tackle it individually, one by one, family by family, blog by blog, like 
one at a time. Right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I think it's step takes, by oh, step. <laughs> step <laughs> day by day. Um, I think it takes both. I think you've got to work yourself, you know, as the more people see you, it's like all stereotypes, right? The more you can break it and say, I'm not unusual. I'm, I'm one of many people just like me. But I also think we need to change the way the media sees us. And the more vocal we are, both with our mouths and our pocketbooks, to say, not okay. It's not just Helen Mirren and Jane Fonda and, you know, people that are actually still working. It's, it's all the rest of us, too. And you need to acknowledge us. The fact that we're invisible to the media is just stunning to, to both of us. We just... Why is that? Do you know why that is? <laughs> <laughs> we have large purses too, which is really, you know, we're the ones that buy stuff. Exactly. And I, I think it has to do with aesthetics in the way that you look. Because even though, like you said, Helen Mirren's gorgeous and they dress her up and put her on the cover of Vogue, young girls want to see like figures they can aspire to. And when they see someone like us, even though we'll look gorgeous and wear, you know, Gucci clothes, they can't relate and aspire to that. And the media, I think, follows that narrative. You know, if you go on Instagram, I mean, look at, look what's on Instagram. You know, all these scantily clad or barely clad women that, and and the advertisers flock to them and you'll always see media articles about them. And, and I just really think it's because women have this, young women have this illusion of beauty. And that's what they, you know, they're attracted to and the media just targets in on that and we get screwed. <laughs> well, there's a pretty interesting story actually in today's Wall Street Journal about TikTok, mm. uh, which I have, nothing much to do with. But the story is about how a whole bunch of young people are following people in their 80s and 90s and finding them entertaining and also finding that they remind them of their own grandparents, especially now when they can't see their own grandparents. So that I thought was uh, quite interesting. But you're absolutely right. The media uh, and, and people who market things, we are we have much more wealth than these young people but um, people don't seem to see us. So we agree that we should be doing this person by person and blog by blog, but one of the efforts of Lester is also to build a community of people mm. so that we can do things together and we can, and we can act in a way that will broaden the message, all, all of the messages to our own cohort, to the marketers, to young women, to everybody, because if we can just change the image, the young women, they don't see the right images either. If they see the if they saw the three of us, I would think they would be pretty interested in what we're doing and how we're doing it. So it's a question of um, getting out there, I think, getting the image out there. I agree totally. I agree. Um, you ladies have a podcast I started listening to, which is wonderful. Can you talk to a little bit uh, about what what you talk about? What's the topic? Is it a diverse topic? So like, just give us a quick overview. Sure. Um, well, our generation, as we've said before, is unprecedented. Like, as Karen says, the, the pandemic is unprecedented. Our generation of women that worked and are reaching retirement is, is unprecedented, too. And so there were really two motivations. One, as a group of women, we broke a lot of barriers and we established ourselves in the workplace, except that our stories are never told. And so looking around, we said, you know, we, we did stuff. I mean, as a, as a generation of women, we did stuff and our stories are nowhere. So let's start recording them. So for the most part, our guests are women that worked. We talk about their careers, the battles that they fought, the, the games that they had to play, what they did right, what they did wrong, and now how they're looking at retirement. What are they doing now? How are they using what they learned? Are they glad that they worked? Are they, you know, sad that it was over? How are they how are they navigating retirement? The two exceptions for those guests are our daughters, who we were brave enough to let interview us. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, they're at it 
from another perspective, but it is also part of our Luster audience, the generation of women that follows us. So we've tried to incorporate them as well to say, we have a lot of experience that we can share and it may be useful for them. And how many years has Luster been? How long is it launched for? It's been up for four years. Oh, four years. That's yep. great. That's great. Yep, it is great. It's been a huge amount of fun and uh, we've learned a lot from a lot of different people, but yes, it's been great fun. Awesome. What do you plan to do with Luster um, in terms of building your community? Do you do anything outside of the internet? Do you have group meetings, book clubs? I mean, anything like that where people can, well now because of COVID obviously, but say like non-COVID, <laughs> what were your plans? What are you looking to do moving forward too? Well, we did have a number of uh, events where we had discussions of one sort or another. We had political discussions. We had discussions from medical experts about various things. We met people, we had uh, drinks uh, just to sit around a table and talk about things. We actually set up some salons with uh, people who are, in the, women who are in their late 30s, early 40s to talk about exactly what Erica was talking about. We were relatively horrified when we heard their stories about what went on in their workplaces, but we can, uh, we obviously this is the same things we went through. So we thought maybe it would help for them to speak with us. So we had quite a few in-person activities and we've had quite a few, you know, um, webcam things where we've tried to yes. replicate that. It's not uh, nearly as much fun, especially since you don't have any wine and cheese, but we've done our best. And that is definitely part of it to have gatherings. We do want to bring people together in the same place and talk about things and uh, hear about um, matters that are of interest to all of us. So yes, that's a very important part of what we're doing. Wonderful. What do you find the biggest worry is amongst women, you know, either approaching retirement or in retirement? What's their biggest anxiety producing thing? Who am I now without my job? I think wow. the real, the identity question of, for women that had, particularly those that had careers they loved and be, very much identified with them, like Karen and I did, we were lawyers, you, you know, a broadcaster. If you take that away, who am I? So I think the big question is, who am I? And the sub question under that is, what is my, what is my purpose now? I mean, how do I, how am I relevant? to the world outside of my immediate family and those that, you know, have to love me, putting aside those, <laughs> <laughs> how do I, because <laughs> they're required. But That's funny. Outside of those people, how do I see myself in the world and how do I identify my purpose? I think Karen, would you agree with that or? I would completely agree with that. Yes. It's very, if you, as you know, I'm, Sure, Caroline, if you work really hard for many, many years and you love your work, you are your work. Someone says to you, what do you do? You say, I am whatever it is you're doing. And then all of a sudden overnight, you don't do that anymore. And someone says, well, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm retired. And they look at you like you've got some dread disease and it's all over. So you have to come up with a new you. Uh, it's not exactly a new you, it's built on who you've been all this time. Mm -hmm but you do have to have a new way to present yourself and a new purpose in life and a new, um, something new to talk about. So actually we have found people instinctively, if they meet us and they, you know, they're not aware of who we are exactly. And if you say, uh, I was a lawyer for a long time and they say, well, what do you do now? If you say I'm retired, they really could, lose interest. If you say, well, I have this great website and I'm meeting all these people, and I'm doing all these things and I have all these events, they really get interested and they have immediately a different image of what a retired woman looks like. Do they look to you guys for solutions? Do they ever say, what, what am I supposed to do now? And then you like guide them towards or give them some ideas how to discover their new self. Is that some of the expectations? We think that we, because we spend so much time, Carol Ann, figuring it out, 
you know, trying to an inordinate amount of time, really. <laughs> Because, because we were, we were so puzzled. So slow, you know, to figure this out. Um, they look to us to say, well, how did you do it? How did you get to where you are now? How did you find kind of the equilibrium, you know, a new equilibrium for yourselves? So I think we've, you know, pre-pandemic, we were talking, one of the big issues in people that were retiring is how do I deal with the afternoon? You know, in the morning, it was so easy to have coffee and read the paper and do your bills and do all the things that you had to do. And then the afternoon hit and you were in this panic mode. So pre-pandemic, a lot of the conversations we were talking about was that process of it's OK. You know, it's OK to feel terrible. It's OK to try to figure it out. It's, a, you know, you're not alone kind of conversations. Now the conversation with the pandemic is a bit different because the morning is the same as the afternoon. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so it's true. The same as the <laughs> evening. And the, the issues now are more about how do you stay connected? How do you have new people in your life? How do you not get divorced? Yeah. How do you not want to kill your husband? <laughs> That's a that, key issue. Yes, that is a key issue. <laughs> at least without being caught. Right. <laughs> are you ladies truly... Do you feel like you've hit the mark that, I, I mean, I'm sure you miss your legal worlds. Do you feel like, wow, this is like what I've been born to do? Like, did you have an epiphany like that? I'm so curious to know. Or do you feel like you just comfortably found a place where you can like help other people and find a great level of self-fulfillment at the same time? Well, that I think is actually one of the key parts of the process of retirement. When we first left our jobs, we were not happy. We loved our jobs. We missed our jobs and we, we felt a little bit at sea or a lot at sea. And so we weren't happy at all. And even today, I miss my job. I loved my job and it was great fun. And I look back with great warmth. But after a while, you do start to realize, okay, there is an actual world out there that's different, and there are things to do that you've never done before, and let's do it. So actually, um, Eric and I had a conversation a couple of years ago, but it took a couple of years uh, when we said to each other, do you want your old job back? And the answer to that was no, no, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. It's not exactly that I feel that we feel that we were born to do this. We were very, very fulfilled doing what we were doing. But we also have come to understand there's lots of other things to do and we're really having fun with this. So this, uh, it's been great fun. One thing, by the way, I would say that is really helpful in this process, which is a difficult process, is to have a friend who you can talk to, especially a friend going through the same thing and you can say to each other, you know, what is this all about? And then Erica is right. We examined it all inordinately, but that's partly because we said to each other, what is going on here? We've got to get to the bottom of this. And so doing it with somebody is yes. hugely important. I would agree. I would agree. Now that many companies are opting folks to work from home, other than the question about salary versus experience, do you see retired career women competing with millennials for stay at home jobs? And part of that I wanted to ask you, too, is how about do you find a lot of women who've retired but have opened like their own consulting business? Well, let me let me start at the back. I mean, the entrepreneurial spirit in our generation is pretty um, was latent, <laughs> you know, I think, but has really um, blossomed, I think, pre pandemic and, and during the pandemic from cannabis businesses to all sorts of consulting, writing books, all sorts of stuff that is really just lovely to see. I mean, I would include us in that category that we couldn't find, you know, we couldn't find anything institutional of people that wanted our skills. So we, we started something of, of our own. So I think that's interesting. I think on the competing part, I would answer no, and I'm putting aside people that need to work, and obviously they're in the job market because either they have to be or they want, you know, they're they're bound and determined to be. I don't think we see ourselves as competing at all. 
I think we don't want to work in the same way that the younger generation is or has to to succeed. I think we see ourselves as mentors, coaches, sharers, experienced people that can add value because we've been there, done that. Mm-hmm. But we don't want to do it. We want to just make you better at doing it. I, I think that's really the role that we we want we want to play. So we're kind of um, Karen always refers to Wendy Rhodes, you know, on the billion on billions is the kind of she can the perfect model for being outside the you know the um, the the institution itself, but playing a valuable role. Right. We don't think that there should be competition because we're completely different in the, what we have to offer. Young people are young and strong and they know all kinds of things that are going on today. But by definition, a young person can't possibly have the experience and the perspective that we do. They will, but exactly. they can't. Yeah. Exactly. So we should be together. We shouldn't be competing. The thing that boggles my mind is if you look at like corporate America, Um, I have a very dear friend who's struggling. She's in her 60s. She doesn't want to retire. And she's in the market looking for a job. And of course, her salary is, you know, expectations are a lot higher than a millennial would be. But given her experience in over 25 years in this industry, she can't understand why She's willing to take less money, but yet the corporations would rather hire the younger, inexperienced people. How do you wrap your head around something like that? Millions of women are experiencing this. How do you come to grips? How do you react to that? And can you confront a corporation with this? I think the argument has to be a diversity one. Right. I think that corporations have begun to accept in other areas, right, that a diverse workforce is not only a more profitable and successful workforce, but is is what a corporation, a corporate entity has a societal obligation to be. Right. I think that's an accepted proposition. The only problem with it is they think of diversity in terms of sexual orientation and race and right. gender, but not age. Why? Why is that? And I think that part of the argument that she should be making and we should be making is that different perspectives also come not only with gender and race and and environment and backgrounds and all those other things, but it also comes with age. And so if you really are a believer in in the value proposition behind diversity, that different perspectives lead to better decisions, then you need to include older people too. How do you confront that? You know, when you keep getting turned down for position after position, how do you how do you come to grips with that? Like even emotionally, she's having a hard time. Yeah, I can imagine. It's very very difficult. I mean, obviously that's one of our objectives with Luster, but that doesn't result in any immediate change for people going through it right now. I I do think this is partly based on old physiology, if you will, as we were talking earlier about retirees in the 1950s, they have a shorter, much shorter lifespan. And, you know, people at that age, at at that time, might have gotten a little dotty by the time they were 70. It's just not going to, and I think corporations worry about that sort of thing. And it's just not consistent with the facts of today. Right. Today, it's much more likely that uh, both women and men will be healthy and acute and useful, as well as experienced. And so they're incredibly valuable. But I think corporate America may not have quite come to understand that yet. And it's the same issue, of course, with people who market products. We are people who are still out there doing things. We want, like Erica is just desperate to buy some fancy new race car and nobody thinks that she wants a fancy new race car. Red, exactly. (laughs) And so, you know, they've got to wake up and the only way we figured out to make them wake up is to have this website and to, we, in the olden days when you could go where places and give talks, we did that too. We talked to various uh, corporate entities 
And we'll do more of that. But it is a big education project. And uh, we hope that everybody who wants to join this effort will keep talking because that's the only way it's going to work. Absolutely. Just in, Caroline, just then one, one other thing for your friend. One of the things that we have encountered is rational or not, this kind of fear that if a corporate hires an older person, that person at some point will become dotty, less than, less than at their full capabilities, and they will be stuck in this legal morass of age discrimination if they choose to uh, terminate that person for those kinds of reasons. Mm. And the way around that, just to put it out there for your listeners, really is this, I'll call it the Wendy model, um, but this freelance model, because if you're engaged, whether it's for years or months, by project, by time limit, right, then you don't, then you're not in that morass of forever, forever, forever. So one of the things that we found for those people that are willing to uh, try out some older folks in their, in their workforce is that the freelance model is pretty effective. They're much more amenable to it especially as a way to get in the door. And I can actually think of a couple of people that got in the door that way and converted that to full-time employment. Awesome. Just a thought. Awesome. And it's funny because when you look at companies like Google, they're notorious for only hiring young folks, millennials and so on. I used to work in a building they owned and um, I remember seeing all these young people going up in the elevator for interviews and <laughs> we would joke like if we saw somebody even in their 30s or 40s you know because we knew that they weren't going to get hired so it's 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 really awful when a big corporation like that is known for ages and when they stand for so much in other areas like the environment and race their you know racism and everything they're so diligent about making sure they know we know but when it comes to hiring people our age it's just not even talked about like it's like a big dark secret it's crazy it is crazy but we've got to fix it all together we're gonna to have to fix this and we will if we all yes. take if we work together we will fix it do you think it's worth it for women to lower their like um salary expectations to compete today like what would you tell them well, I would tell them that if they come across a job that's interesting, I mean, first of all, assuming they can lower their salary expectations, that's something to consider. But uh, I, I would go back to what Erica said. I would suggest more that they talk about a restructured job so that it is not a job within the corporate structure and the, the reporting structure. It's a job that's out to the side where people can ask for and get distilled advice uh, you obviously you have to report to somebody but it's you're not going to be in the structure of people who are on the way up you already made it to the top and now you should be in a different place and it just should be a different kind of a job frankly you should be paid much more because you have all this experience but um i think that the discussion really has to start with rethinking what the job is that's great advice so maybe you were applying for director of, of like marketing and maybe you should lower your expectations in a way or just like step completely out of marketing. What would you recommend? Or, or, cha yeah. or change the, your role with respect to the director of marketing. Maybe if you have all that experience, you should be the chief advisor to the new younger director of marketing. Maybe your role really is the one that said that goes to the table because people do like experience at the table, right? Of saying, you know, I'm going to sit over here. I'm not going to get in your way, you younger person that is on your way up. I'm not going to get in your way, but I am going to make you better. Mm, that's great. I love that. Where, where do you see Luster in, you know, three, four years? What are your goals and aspirations? Well, Karen's going to be a billionaire. <laughs> that's, that's my plan. Yep. I'm glad I make it friends. <laughs> but I'll share with, with Erica. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, I'm prepared to share. 
Yes. <laughs> but mainly, mainly what we want to do is really, really increase our voice. And that means increasing the number of people who join us and it increases increasing the number of people who listen to us. So we're embarked on an effort to do both of those things, to try to yeah. reach more of our audience, both the one people like us, but also younger people, and to reach business in all of its forms, employers or marketers or whatever, and say, hey, guys, wake up. This is a huge resource. So the bigger our voice is, the more likely it is we're going to have an impact. Where well, do you want your news magazine? Oh, I'm sorry. We wanted oh, to no, be news yeah. magazine. <laughs> you know, right. that's, exactly. that's who we want to be. That's awesome. Uh, a magazine would be great, too. I mean, like an actual physical magazine. That would be awesome. <laughs> Where would do you be fun. It would be. I think it'd be very popular. Where do you get your ideas for topics and how frequently do you publish? I mean, I just subscribed and I'm seeing I get newsletters already. Um, do you have staff that takes care of that as well? Or, well, let's first tackle where do you get your ideas for topics? Do you use what's trending out there? How do you do it? Well, we, um, we have really sort of two sources, maybe three sources. One is retirement and the process of retirement. So we've been through it. We know what it's about. We'd like to talk about the different stages of retirement. One is certainly trending. So, for example, if we if the presidential election has just been resolved and we want to say something about how the people who are in the White House should pay close attention to us. And then the other part is uh, lifestyle. So here are the things you can do. Here are the things we're doing. Here are the things we want to do. Here are the things we want to buy. Here's the places we want to go. So it's uh, reflective, really, of our life, but also our lives, but also of our um, interests in moving the conversation forward as far as people like us. Erica, what, what would you say? The only about thing that? I, th I add is I think that ideas come from people like you in our network of right. conversations that we might have with you or with anybody else that say, oh, wait, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's think about that and maybe we can write something about that too. It's, it's sometimes I think the attraction is the attraction of the familiar. Oh, I felt like that. Oh, that's how I feel. You put words to something that I'm going through. And sometimes it's about something totally new that nobody's ever heard of before. And we happen to come upon. So how are you dealing with the divide? Because, and I'm talking about like just the divide of America. So we have this huge issue going on and I almost feel as a woman, I'm even further divided. Um, how are you dealing with that challenge so as a not to offend and to actually bring folks together? Are you dealing with that issue at all? Yes, but, but it's hard. Right? Yes. Because... I mean, clearly we have views on a lot of those things. Luster is not about those things. I mean, we're sad. Let, let me start by saying we're saddened by it. It's not the America that we feel like we've lived in for most of our lives, where everybody right. has a wide variety of opinions, but everybody's kind of pulling towards everybody, you know, towards one America. Um, we are sad by things like, what's happened to the American flag. We're, we're sad by all of that, I think, but we're trying to keep Luster, Luster's voice to those issues that affect our demographic. In other words, to the extent that, like you mentioned before, Carolyn, about the pandemic. I mean, the, the you know, okay, it only affects old people, but they die, so who cares? You know, right. maybe, maybe they die a little early. We have something to say about that. That's not okay, right? And that's part of the divide, you know, this is dispensable. And we comment on things like that, that affect stereotypes, that affect us personally. But I think we're trying to show people that there are things on which we can agree more than there are things that, more than highlighting things on which we differ. Is that fair? I love that. I love that. Hey, that's, that's exactly right, yeah. Mainly our, our objective is to say that if all the politicians, us, everyone would be happy. 
So that's our main I message. Agree. I agree. <laughs> the thing that scares me the most is the word dispensable. Um, that just yes. like raises such a level of anxiety in us um, because it's, you know, as you know, it's quite the opposite. It's crazy how we can be looked at that way. And anything, anything that can change that perspective, you guys have me in, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Because that word alone is just awful. Well, and the worst part about it is if you thought about the experience of all of us collectively and the wisdom and the, you know, the, the things we've overcome in our lives, yes. all that stuff, we're a national asset. So why anybody, even in the business community, would want to so quickly dissipate, you know, and devalue an asset is beyond us. And I think it's up. Hopefully it's not only up to us, but it's up to us at least to play a role in convincing people that that's just. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, they, you know, the youth of today hope to get to our age and further. So you would think <laughs> it would rally. I mean, we have a great sense of humor. You know, we have a lot of wisdom. We have so much to offer. We have more patience than anybody could know. How are that's you ladies, right? How are you ladies dealing with, you know, the pandemic right now. How are you finding women, you know, in, in our age group dealing with it? Are they really afraid? Or Because you read things about the suicide rate being so high, and it's scary stuff. Like, are you helping women and men overcome that or directing them to maybe resources to help them? Like, what role are you guys playing in that right now? Well, I think uh, Erica mentioned earlier that at the, when this all began, there were maybe it was you, Caroline. There was this message out there that if you're over 65, you you might as well just check out now because you're never going to survive this. It's just terrible. And that message actually was devastating to some of the people that I know who are not young and who live alone in particular, and they weren't sure what to do. And that had a, an effect on their mindset that was very, very negative. And so we're not addressing this so much through luster, but certainly as human beings, we're trying to tell our friends. Some of them are like that. Some of them are like, I don't, I'm going out. I'm not going to live the next 10 years of my life not going out. But we're trying to make sure that people do react intelligently. So you don't need to sit in your room and cower for the next six months. You can go out. You just have to be careful. And so we are trying to talk to people about that. Well, but it was a terrible message, and it was based on, I mean, we're not biologists, and we know that our immune systems are not as good as they were when we were 30 and all that kind of thing. But very few of us are at death's door just because we're 65 <laughs> or over. So we, we don't like that message, and we try to overcome it. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is I think we're, we've reinforced that you can have a community even remotely. And I think we keep re reinforcing that message that there's a, the good news about technology is that there are new ways to connect. And it's not just with the same old people all the time. You can find new people right. um, to talk to. And, the, and that is energizing. It's not as good as in person. It's not as good in a restaurant with a lovely glass of wine between you. But it can work. And you can make it work, um, and it can be rewarding. Yeah. Have you ladies dealt with, like, the topic of romance and, and, and age? <laughs> a bit. We, a little <laughs> bit. We, we actually we met an extraordinary woman who was um, in her 90s, and she was dating via a dating app. God bless. And she, God bless indeed. And she had stories and there. We did. Uh, she wrote a couple of posts for us a couple oh, of years ago. I'll have to go read those. <laughs> they, uh, she was unbelievable. She was remarkable. And she had uh, been married for about a million years and her husband had died. And she found out after he died that he had been unfaithful. Oh. And that made her very unhappy for a while. And then she said to herself, I am not going to allow that man to make me unhappy. I'm going to go out. So Good. she started dating and she had fun and she was having a, she's having a great life and she's meeting men and she's having a good time. So that was quite inspirational. Oh, I can imagine. I can't wait to read about that. Are you guys constantly discovering like new things about, you know, your, 
your growth on this planet as you're aging? Like, are you constantly discovering things or are you just like at a point where I, I've seen it all? You can't show me anything. No. <laughs> not, neither of us, I think one of the, the attractions of our friendship is neither of us are very interested in the past, is very interested in the past. Mm. And so we're just interested in what we can do next. Um, and every day, I mean, since retirement, Karen got her pilot's license. I have taken um, a massive number of interior design classes. I still can't use a T-bar correctly, but, you know, I work on it. Um, it's too, pencils are too, it's too hard. But, you know, I think whether it's figuring out Microsoft Teams for a project or figuring out some crazy, how do you do technology for some other purpose, I mean, we're constantly learning new things and in the course of learning new things, meeting new people because yeah. every time, you know, every time there's a thing that you don't know, it has people associated with it. Right, right. So it's kind of like, right. you know, podcasts. We started when we did our podcast. I think we met a whole community of people we would have never have met had young and younger and older of podcasters, podcasterville um, that we never knew. And look at you. You know, I mean, if we were in a non-pandemic exactly. world, we'd say, when are we going to get a glass of wine together or something? Right? Wonderful. Do you guys see a book in your future at all, either together or individually? We thought about that, and we're still thinking about that. We're, uh, we're basically kind of lazy, so who knows? <laughs> but um, we are thinking about it, yes. Wonderful. I would read it. <laughs> All right. Well, then that'll give us some motivation. <laughs> Maybe you want to write something for it. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely read it. Well, I'm so pleased to have met you both. I think that what you're doing is brilliant and it's so needed, desperately needed. And I'm going to do my best to make sure that the word gets out there about luster.net. And of course, we're going to let everybody know where to find you, ladies. Is there a way that folks can reach out to you if they have questions or comments? Is there a place on your website? Contact me. Just share a little bit about that if folks want to reach out to you. Absolutely. There's a uh, the Luster um, email is uh, info at luster.is. And uh, people are reach out regularly. And so we respond and there's comment sections. There's a lot of ways to interact with us and we're very active on Facebook. So that's another option. Awesome. So, and I'll make sure yeah. I share all those links. Thank Excellent. You thank you so much. So much. It's been a, thank you. It's been a, a privilege getting to speak to both of you and I hope we can do it again. We you would know. love to. It's been great fun. Thank you so much. Thank you.